Hey, welcome back. This is part two of five truths about marriage. If you did not catch last week's video, the first two truths, you want to go catch that and then you can get caught up on what we're talking about here. We did two last week. We're going to do three today. So we're going to talk about five truths about marriage that somebody likely did not tell you. And the hope is that this will normalize some of what you're experiencing, remove maybe some hopelessness you're feeling if you did not expect this and are now experiencing this. That's what we're going to talk about today on relationships. Hey, welcome to Relation Shots. If this is your first time hanging out, welcome to the place to get practical relationship advice that actually works in your relationship. I know, imagine that. If you've not already done so, go ahead and click the subscribe button and the bell notification so you don't miss upcoming videos. If you want a free guide to intimacy, hit the link in the description area below. If you're looking for a proven place to work on your marriage and connect with other couples, check out our Altered Marriage Membership tons of resources, videos, worksheets, and other couples you can connect with in your marriage journey. So we've been discussing five truths about marriage that probably were never told to you. So whether you're dating, engaged, newly married, or been married three decades, you have either experienced or will experience these truths and I want to set you up for success. So that's why we're talking about them today. So we've already covered the two in last week's video, which is when you get married, you sign up for a specific set of unresolvable issues. That was number one. And number two was you get a front row seat to your spouse's growth process. So number three truth about marriage that you may not have been told is that when you get married, you get an invitation to be part of your spouse's healing process. You may have noticed that every one of us walks into marriage with some baggage from our past. Now that baggage will impact our marriage, not if, but will impact our marriage at some point. The question is whether it impacts it in a small way or a large way, depend usually on the type of trauma or baggage we bring in, the woundedness we walk in with, and how much work we have done individually to heal these areas before we ever step into marriage. But the reality is when you marry somebody, you become part of their healing process. Whether you like it or not, you are signing up to be a part of their healing process, which means when you know what their areas of woundedness, their areas of trauma are, what your job is, is to guard that, is to protect that and is to help them heal those areas, not exasperate it, continue to tear open the wound, continue to poke at those things. So if they came in, for instance, with some abandonment issues, that's a wound from their past. Maybe a mom or dad left them when they were young. Maybe they've had past relationships and everybody has always broken up with them or left them. They come in with abandonment issues. If you're part of their healing process, what that means is when you're in conflict, what you don't do is decide to withdraw Stonewall and give them the silent treatment because you know they have an abandonment issue. So when there's conflict, they want to resolve the conflict. And if you decide you're going to withdraw, distance yourself, give them the silent treatment and not talk to them, all you're doing is re-stirring up those feelings, triggering those feelings of abandonment that they already have. You're not helping them heal. You're making it worse. So you have to choose to step into the conflict, whether you like it or not, and try to resolve it, continue to affirm and let them know you're not going anywhere. You're here and you're going to work it out even if we don't have a solution right now. Maybe your spouse has rejection issues from past relationships or the home they grew up in. What that means is when they try to reach out and resolve a conflict, when they try to make a bid for connection with you, you don't reject their attempts because you're in a bad mood that day. You want to receive those so that you can help heal those feelings of rejection. Maybe they grew up in a home that was all about performance and perfectionism and they felt like they never measured up and they always had to do better in order to earn their parents' love or their siblings' love. You get them in an environment with you and what you don't want to do is always point out their flaws, always critique them, always tell them where they don't measure up. You want to create an environment of grace where you're building them up and you're affirming them and you're reassuring them and you're letting them know that even when they don't perform well, you continue to love them anyway because your love is unconditional. You continue to give grace in those situations where they need grace. So when you get married, 
you don't just get to look at the spouse and say, you know what, your issues are your issues. You need to deal with them. You are actually getting an invitation in to be part of their healing process and you have to take that seriously, which means you got to know what their wounds are before you step into marriage with them so you can decide, I don't have the capacity or the desire to try to help them heal in that area. Be honest with yourself before you step into it. But once you step into it, you're a part of their healing process. Truth number four about marriage is that marriage is not fair. Yeah, sorry, I did a whole video on this. You can check out why fairness isn't good in marriage anyway, but fairness is just good for good, bad for bad. That whatever you give, you should also receive in equal proportion. That's fairness. But that's not healthy in a marriage for a lot of reasons that you can check out the why fairness doesn't work in marriage. But what I want to talk about here is that we all have different capacities. The reason that marriage is not fair is because we don't all walk in with the same capacities. Whether it's work capacities, the ability to uh, juggle multiple things without succumbing to the stress, uh, whether it's uh, the need for sleep that we have or don't have, uh, whatever it is, we have different capacities. And I think when you have a greater capacity in an area than your spouse, you also have greater responsibility. So if I've got greater capacity, I don't need to look at my spouse and go, well, if I'm doing this, you need to do this too, because it's requiring much more energy and effort on their part because they don't have the same capacity. Same thing happens with, we talked about healing the broken areas. Listen, if you're more emotionally healthy in a relationship, you have a greater responsibility to exercise that emotional health in someone who's not as emotionally healthy. Listen, people who grow up in toxic, dysfunctional families or where there was abuse or trauma, they spent a lot of emotional energy trying to survive. Whereas somebody else who grew up in a healthy environment, they got to spend that same energy maturing emotionally. So when those two people step into a marriage, one's got a way higher emotionally healthy capacity than the one who was trying to survive. So I think the person who is more healthy, more mature emotionally, has a greater responsibility for healthy behavior, for doing the right things in the relationship. Now you may say, that's not fair. Exactly, marriage is not fair. If you're people of faith, I think the one who has more spiritual maturity and more spiritual health has a greater responsibility than the person that's more immature in that area you have a greater capacity and ability to walk in Christ-likeness than the person who's not as spiritually mature. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, then they just get off the hook because, you know, they just say, well, I'm just not as mature as you. I don't think that's a crutch they should sleep on. I, I think they should actually work in that area. But what I'm telling you is that marriage is not fair because we have different capaci capacities. And I think the person with a greater capacity has a greater responsibility for what they can contribute and bring to the marriage. It's not always gonna be 50-50 or 100-100. In some areas, it may be 70-30. In other areas, 60-40, because we have different capacities based on the experiences that we've had, based on the innate talents and gifts that we have, based on our makeup and how our creator made us. So marriage is not fair. And number five, this is specifically for people of faith, so if you're not a person of faith, you can either listen or deuces, I'll see you next time. But here's a truth that nobody told you about marriage in church. Marriage will test your theology. I see too many people who grow up in the church, who meet their spouse in the church, who say to themselves, well, God is gonna help us through this. And listen, I know God can and will help us through any situation but don't overestimate your spiritual maturity and overlook red flags and issues you don't like and jump in the relationship saying, because we're both Christians, we can both lean our theology and that will help us make a great marriage work. Listen, when the pain in your relationship gets greater than your theology, you will make untheological decisions. That's where the people are like, well, I know God's against divorce, but he wouldn't want me to be unhappy. Well, I know that the Bible says X, but I'm going to go ahead and do Y. See, the, the problem we have is we, we see red flags or we see issues in the relationship that maybe we don't like. And we go, but you know what? We both love Jesus. And so God's going to just help us work this out. Listen, you will get tired if you have to get up in the morning and jump over hurdle after hurdle after hurdle after hurdle to make the relationship work. So what I would say to you is, Marry a person 
that you know you could be married to in your flesh if you had no God in your life. And then when you add your faith to the mix, your relationship should be phenomenal. But don't go, well, I mean, I don't really like the way they look. I'm not attracted to them. Um, and their laugh is annoying and they chew too loud and I don't love the way they dress, but hopefully I can change that. And you got all these things that you don't like and you say, but I know they love God and I love God. And so we can make this work. But every morning when you wake up and you turn over and look at the person, you're reminded that you don't like the way they look. And every meal you're reminded that they chew too loud. And every joke you tell, you're reminded that you can't stand their laugh. And at some point, your theology is not going to help you push through all those things. And the reason I say that is because if you and I are honest, do you always make the godly decision? Do you always submit your will into obedience with God? The answer is no, we don't always. We don't always walk in the Spirit. And so when you decide, I'm going to overlook all this stuff in the flesh that I struggle with because I love God and my theology is there and it's going to help me, I'm telling you, marriage will test your theology. So you best be able to be married to the person with or without your faith. And when you add faith to it, it's going to make the relationship even better. So there's three more truths about marriage that likely nobody told you. I hope that helps. I'd love to hear your comments in the comment section below. And until next time, I'll see you right back here on Relationships.